This is video 7 in our series on tensor calculus. Last time we introduced the idea of a coordinate transformation. This time we'll follow up with several examples to show how they look in real life. Our first example is a transformation between plane polar coordinates and Cartesian coordinates. Here I've got a diagram in which I have uh, both coordinate systems illustrated. You'll see here our value r for polar coordinates out to the point P. This is the angle theta. And I also have on the diagram the Cartesian coordinate system. This is the x-axis running this way and the y-axis running up in this direction like that. Okay, the first thing we need to do is to establish a correspondence to our uh, assigned variable values in tensor calculus. So we'll do it this way. We'll say that the primed coordinate system is going to be represented by Cartesian coordinates and our unprimed system will be represented by our plane polar coordinates this way. Okay, so if you remember what we're trying to do here, we're going to, um, we'll start with, um, I guess, the prime system. So we have this equation from last time that the zi prime coordinates are going to be some function of the z coordinates. Now you remember this is uh, a free index, and since we're working in a two dimensional system, this is really two equations in, in, in one. In the specific example, it means that we're looking for x to be some function x of r and theta. Likewise, we're looking for y to be a function y of r and theta. So these two equations together are represented by this one statement. The free index is expanded to values of 1 and 2 because it's two-dimensional. All right, how do we proceed? Well, this is a very simple example. If we drop this perpendicular, we recognize that we already know that the coordinates for P and polar coordinates are R and theta, but by dropping this perpendicular, we can see that this value right here is going to be the X value, and this one is the Y value. So finding these functions is just a matter of solving this right triangle with trigonometry. So the um, value of x divided by r is going to be equal to the cosine of theta. That's the adjacent side over the hypotenuse relative to the angle. And that means that x is going to be equal to r times the cosine of theta. Likewise, y divided by r is equal to the sine of theta. And y, therefore, is equal to r times the sine of theta. So these two expressions right here represent what we're looking for there. We have x as a function of r and theta, and y as a function of r and theta. So I will put those into our fact sheet here, like this. And that's the transformation of the z prime coordinates from the z coordinates. All right, so we have to do the reverse now. We're going to find the uh, z coordinates as a function of the z prime coordinates. So zi will be a function of z prime. So this time we're looking for the value of r as a function of x and y. We're also looking for theta as a function of, sorry, back again, looking for a function of x and y. And again, these two are represented by this one equation. All right, this is a very simple geometry again because x, y, we know from the Pythagorean theorem that r squared is going to equal x squared plus y squared. So r is simply the square root of x squared 
plus y squared. We also know that the tangent of theta is y over x, so theta is going to be the arc tangent of y over x. And so this expression and this expression represent the desired functions here. We have a function r, which is a function of x and y, and theta is a function of x and y. So we'll drop those in place right here, and we're done with this transformation. So notice what we have. We've got, we'll show it one more time. This is, um, this is our assignment of the variables, and given these assignments, then these are the functions of um, x and y as a function of r and theta, and here we have r and theta as functions of x and y. And that's what we mean by a coordinate transformation. The next example is a transformation between cylindrical polar coordinates and the Cartesian coordinate system. And here I have a diagram of our cylindrical polar coordinates. You'll remember that our variables there are rho, which is this distance. Then there's the angle phi, which is this angle. Remember the little door that swings out. And then there's uh, the distance z, which is the height above the plane. Now, I've also included a Cartesian coordinate system and aligned it in such a way that it's the x-axis is here, the y-axis is here, and the z-axis goes up this way. So it is a right-handed coordinate system uh, in which the x-axis corresponds to the uh, value where phi is equal to 0. Okay, so as before, we start by assigning the variables. Only this time, of course, we have a three-dimensional example. So that means that we're going to have three values for our, our coordinates. Again, we'll let the prime coordinates be represented by the Cartesian coordinates. The unprimed coordinates will be the three coordinates for cylindrical polar coordinates. All right, same drill as before. We start out with the recognition that we're looking for zi prime as a function of z, which means we're looking for x as a function of rho, phi, and z. Likewise, y is a function of rho, phi, and z, and z is a function of rho, phi, and z. So this time, these three equations are represented by this one. You see how nicely the, the syntax represents either two dimensions or three dimensions. Here, the same form works for three dimensions because we have three variables and we also have three parameters in our parameter list. Okay, what I'm going to do here, this is going to be very easy, very simple. Um, I'm going to ask you to use your imagination a little bit. Imagine, if you will, that you're situated up here on the z-axis looking downward. And as you do that, you position yourself such that the x-axis is to your right and the y-axis is upward. So if you were up here looking down, you'd see the x-axis out here you'd see the y-axis up here, and you're up here above looking down from the top of the z-axis. If you did that, you'd see our little door swing out, a value rho to our point P, and this angle would be phi. Now, if you're quick to pick up on this, you'll recognize that the relationship between phi and rho here related to x and y is exactly what we derived in the previous example for plane polar coordinates. So the relationship being the same, we can just use the results we got from the plane polar example to give us those. And finally, z is the same variable in both systems, so our third equation is just going to be z equals z. So let's look at what uh, that looks like in our transformation. And we'll just move down and drop that in place right here. You can see that the, the relationship right 
here is exactly the same that we had for plane polar coordinates where we were dealing with r and theta instead of rho and phi. Well, that means that the inverse transformation is the same too, right here. And as I mentioned before, z is equal to z. When you stop and think about it, this makes a lot of sense because cylindrical polar coordinates is really just a third dimensional example of plane polar coordinates. If you look down from the top of it, we're dealing with plane polar coordinates on many different planes, and the planes are, are identified with the variable z. So again, this is the, the result we're looking for for cylindrical polar coordinates. Again, we have values of x, y, and z that are functions of rho, phi, and z. We have rho, phi, and z that are functions of x, y, and z. That's what we mean by a coordinate transformation. Next, we have spherical polar coordinates. You'll recall that our coordinates there are r, which is this distance, theta, which is this angle, and phi, which is this angle. And as before, we have the Cartesian coordinate system with the x-axis here, y-axis here, and the z-axis this way. OK, this time we assign our variables this way. Again, we're letting the z prime coordinates be those of the Cartesian system. And the unprimed system will be the coordinates in spherical polar coordinates. So as before, we're looking for values of x, y, and z, functions of x, y, and z, that are functions of the variables r, theta, and phi. All right, this time we're going to make use of what we did in the uh, cylindrical polar coordinates. Let's write down what we found there. We found that x was equal to rho cosine phi, y was equal to rho sine phi, and z was equal to z. And if we put those on our diagram, this was the value of rho, this was the value of z. Sorry, of z. Okay, now um, what I wanted you to see is that uh, we have a right triangle right here in which this is r. So we can very quickly use our knowledge of this right triangle to find the relationship between rho and z as it relates to r and theta. It's um, pretty obvious if you look at the solution of this right triangle that rho is simply r times the sine of theta. That's the opposite side related to the hypotenuse related to this angle. And z is equal to r cosine theta. It's the adjacent side related to the hypotenuse. So what we can do is to take these results and substitute them back up here. That means that x is going to be equal to rho cosine phi, and rho is r sine theta times the remaining factor of cosine phi. Likewise, y is equal to r sine theta, this is rho again, times the remaining factor of sine phi, and the final term, z, being equal to this term, r cosine theta. These, then, are the three transformation equations for x, y, and z. So we'll just drop those in place for our transformation like this. And then for the inverse transformation, let's just do some simple algebra or to uh, derive the values of r theta and phi from these results. To start with, let's uh, square x and y and add them together. So x squared plus y squared equals r squared sine squared theta cosine squared phi plus r squared sine theta squared sine phi squared. And you'll see that we can factor out 
the r squared term, r squared sine squared theta can come out of both terms, leaving cosine squared phi plus sine squared phi. And of course, you know that's equal to 1, which means x squared plus y squared is just r squared sine squared theta. Now, if we add z squared to that, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is going to be equal to this expression plus z squared, which is r squared cosine squared theta. And of course, that can be factored out, the r squared. And again, this identity is 1, which means x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to r squared. Or r is equal r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Now you could have gotten this relationship by geometry, but I just wanted to show you that you could take one result and algebraically invert it to come up with uh, the, the inverse relationship. Well, let's keep going along these lines. If we wanted to find the value of, of theta, well, from this final expression here, you can see that theta is going to be the arc cosine of z divided by r. But of course, we're, we're looking for a result that has only x, y, and z in it. We already know what r is from this, this uh, relationship. So theta is going to be equal to the arc cosine of z divided by square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So that's the value of theta. And then if we take, uh, let's say, this equation and divide it by that equation, you're going to see that y divided by x, I'll do it over here, y divided by x, factors of r sine theta cancel out, and y divided by x is nothing but the tangent of phi, which means that phi is equal to the arc tangent of y over x. And so we have a value of r as a function of x, y, and z, theta as a function of x, y, and z, and phi as a function of x, y, and z. And um, that just shows you how you can start with, with these relationships and algebraically determine these three relationships without having to go back to the diagram and do any more geometry or trigonometry. OK, so we'll drop those in place right here. And now we have the complete transformation for spherical polar coordinates. We have x, y, and z as a function of r, theta, and phi. We have r, phi, and theta as a function of x, y, and z. All right, one final example, this time um, a transformation between affine coordinates, or skewed coordinates, and our standard Cartesian system. I'm going to assign variables this way. As before, our z prime coordinates will be those of the Cartesian system. And this time, I'm defining variables u and v to represent the variables in our skewed coordinate system, noting, if you will, that we have scaling factors of a and b associated with our variables u and v, respectively. Now, how that relates to our diagram is that this would be the u-axis. This would be the v-axis. This is the x-axis. And this is the y-axis. OK, now the real twist here is that the scaling factor um, adds this uh, to the matter. This distance right here is our u-coordinate value being the same as this. But because of the scaling factor, the actual Euclidean distance from the origin to this point must be multiplied by our scaling factor. 
So AU is the actual distance from here to this point. Likewise, this value is BV, and it will be the same as this distance. All right, now the key to solving the transformation here is to drop a perpendicular at this point. And note that because this line is parallel to this one, this angle is alpha. And that means that this length being the same as this one, that this vertical perpendicular is going to be BV sine alpha. It's the opposite side over the hypotenuse as related to the angle alpha. And this distance down here is BV cosine alpha. Okay, kind of messy, but you see the idea that, that um, you know, we have this distance right here, which is BV, and these two legs of the right triangle relate with the factors of sine and cosine accordingly. All right, that means that our transformation works out this way. If we want the x value, we're really looking for the Euclidean distance from here all the way out to there. And that's just the summation of AU plus B cosine alpha times V. It's the sum of this term and this term. And I put V at the end, which is kind of customary with these transformations. Now with Y, it's just this expression. So it's B sine alpha times V. Now these two equations are a transformation from UV to XY. Now the inverse transformation just requires a little bit of algebra. First of all, if we divide both sides of the second equation by B sine alpha, we find that V is equal to 1 over B sine alpha times Y. So we're done there. To find the value of U, we subtract B cosine alpha V from both sides, giving us a U equals X minus B cosine alpha times V. Now we substitute the value for V that we just derived here into this expression, a u equals x minus b cosine alpha times 1 over b sine alpha y. And of course the b's cancel. And we can divide through by a, giving us u equals 1 over a times x minus the cosine of alpha over a sine alpha y. So here is the expression of u as a function of x and y. Here's the value of v as a function of x and y. And we can drop all of that in place right here and here. Gives us the value of x as a function of u and v through these equations. And here we can find u and v as functions of x and y. OK, we'll stop here. I know this video has been a little longer than normal, but we did need to go through all four of these examples because we'll be using these results uh, going forward. I highly recommend that you do what I've done here, which is to prepare little fact sheets for each one of our coordinate systems. As we go through future topics, we will add uh, information to each one as it applies, and it'll be very instructive if you keep notes about each one as we go.